Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Dan. It's good to see you all today. Um, why don't we open with a word of prayer, and then we'll have some good discussion. Father, thank you so much again for, um, for your blessings on us. Thank you for all of your gifts, for your loving kindness toward us. Lord, for sending your Son to be our Savior. Father, um, help us to, um, to live by your Spirit, to live in a way that loves the world, that loves you. Um, Lord, change our hearts and orient our hearts toward you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. <clears throat> um, so here we are, lesson three, and um, we'll do a little bit of review of, of lesson two. I had some good conversations uh, following the last class, and I'm always curious to see if, if, this, if the sequence and the case has been made for where we're heading. So we'll, we'll see about that. Um, we'll, we'll, after the review, we'll do a, another scenario. Um, and this one involves doodle bugs and double agents. <clears throat> and then we'll talk about the, um, the ethics triangle. And I've, I've actually given that to you up front. So um, you can take notes on that. And there's, when we do the scenario today, um, the scenario, I'll, I'll direct you toward this triangle and ask you to do something as we, as we talk. So um, let, me, let me step back a little bit. <clears throat> um, at the end of our first session, I gave you an essay um, by C.S. Lewis, and then we used that essay uh, last week. And, and here's, here's a, kind of the essence of Lewis's thing. Um, and remember, Lewis is, He's doing these radio broadcasts, and he is a very, he's a very comfortable speaker. Um, he's speaking to the people, um, so he's not using, um, he's not using theology. He's not using deep um, philosophical terms, but he basically says morality has three parts. Um, there's the there's the interaction between people, and I've summarize that by saying everybody everybody follows the rules um, and he uses the illustration of these ships and as the ships are are in formation they're not crashing into each other they're all navigating on course and they're all following the rules of the road in terms of speed and direction and um, they're 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 cooperating secondly um, he says Everyone has to attend to their, their internal harmony. Not only do we have to get along with people around us, but we have to attend to ourselves. And you, you can't do that first unless you've done the second. You, 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 can't, you can't not crash unless your engine is, is, um, is tidy. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I, and I, I have the word of, um, of a, of a sailor, that this is a tidy engine room. Um, and then thirdly, Lewis says, but where, where is this uh, armada going? You know, where is this convoy going? They have to have a, they have to have a direction. They, they want to be getting somewhere. Otherwise, they should just turn their engines off and sit in the, in the ocean. So um, we talked about that in terms of everybody follows an authority. Everybody attends to their heart, and, and, and we focus on an outcome. And I suggested that, um, that these are the three, I call them buckets, these are the three buckets. W whenever you give reasons for why you do what you do, or why you should be doing something, your reasons fit into one of these three categories. Now, you, you can challenge me on that. Um, Often when I, when I say that, somebody will say, well, let me, I, I can think of a reason, an ethical motivation or whatever, um, that doesn't fit into one of these three categories. I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty confident that these three work. So authority, heart, outcomes. 
by the time we get, by the time we formalize this, I'm going to be using the terms that are on the paper that I gave you today. Um, and I'll tell you what, let's, um, let's make sure that. Could you pass these back to the bathroom? Um, make sure everybody gets one of those. So right now, I'm, again, I'm using some informal terms, and we'll get to some formal terms in a few minutes. And then I said, well, you know what? Um, I actually think the Bible uses this um, this framework. I think this is a I think this is a framework that fits in with the way God has made the world. Um, whether or not a person accepts Christianity or God's word, um, I think we live this way. But if we go to the Bible, we we discover that oh, in, in fact. There are, there are numerous examples of, of how this, this framework, this way that God has made us, functions. And, and here is, we often quote Micah 6, 8 as kind of the ethics verse of the Old Testament. He has told you, O oh man, what is good, what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Um, <clears throat> I rearrange them these three to fit the, the triad that I'm talking about. So I started with walking humbly. What, what does it mean to walk humbly, except that <coughs> you're getting along with people around you, you're, sub, you're submitting to a standard of living. Um, you submit to one another. Um, you're kind. Um, well, actually, that's the second one. But um, you, you, um, you live in a way that loves others. We love God, we love others. The second one, love kindness, um, and that points to the heart, and then to do justice. It's about the deeds and the actions and seeking the good of others. Um, I, so I guess I should say, comments or questions, is that, does that make sense? Is that, I don't buy it, no, yes. <laughs> Um, after this is where we left it last week, and then I thought, well, let me let me put these together um, so you can see what I'm doing. There's a there's a sequence here, of in, in terms of my thought, and there's the there's the law column, and then there's the heart column, and then there's the purpose column. Um, if you're curious, um, we don't have to do this, and. Uh, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. If you're curious and you want to see more of this stuff, where this comes from, there's there's a paper that I've that I've written, and um, it's you can find it in that that URL that's on the paper that I've given you. Um, so it's a it's an ethics paper, and it it takes not only C.S. Lewis, um, but it takes other other philosophers. I've added Cornelius Van Til to this. Some of you might know who he is. He's a, a professor, founding professor from Westminster Seminary. And he, he follows the same triad. And, and others follow the same triad. So I didn't make this up. <laughs> but I, I find it to be very useful. Um, and, and I find it to be useful in terms of just providing a, a synopsis and a framework that we can say, oh. Why do I think this is the right action? And we give our reasons and we say, oh, okay, that makes sense. That fits, that fits into this category of where we are submitting to an authority. Oh, oh, that reason, that fits into something that's coming from the heart. Oh, that reason fits into the outcome, the results category. Um, and so, for simplicity, here we are. I put it in the form of a triangle. I like triangles. They're, they're, re, they're really useful. <laughs> um, um, my doctoral chair saw some triads in my dissertation, and he said, oh, triads, they're overrated. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it works for me. <clears throat> anyway, 
Here's what I'd like you to do. Um, I would like you to think about these three. Uh, we'll spend a little bit more time on these after the scenario, which I'm about to share with you. Um, but as I tell the story, I want you to ask the question, um, are some of these um, showing up in this story? Uh, is there, are there examples of authorities? Are there examples of people being motivated by their hearts? Um, are there examples of um, people looking at the end results and kind of weighing the outcome, okay? Um, this story comes from, uh, I first read it in a book entitled, Would You Kill the Fat Man? Is anybody familiar with that book? Okay, well that's, that's good. At least I'm, I'm giving you fresh um, material here. Um, anyway, it's a, a book by David Edmonds. Um, where he where he wrestles with you know what are the what are our reasons for the things that we do, um, and just, so as not to be entirely dependent on this popular book, um, I actually went yesterday to the the website for MI Five. So that's like the that's like the real deal. That's the sec the, the security service of the of the UK. Because um, I, I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to use this popular book and somebody's going to say, oh, you know, that's, that, that stuff is not true. And it actually turns out that MI5 has pages on these double agents and what they did in, in World War II. So um, there are two of them, and I'll tell you more about Garbo and Zigzag in a, in a couple of minutes. I have to be careful. I, I told the story to my wife yesterday, and she said, you're taking entirely too much time telling that story. <laughs> she said, if you, you, are you talking about ethics or do you, are, you, are you telling stories now? I said, well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm kind of doing both. So here's, here's the story. Um, wait, I've got notes. <laughs> I've got four pages of notes. <laughs> yeah. I'll, let, I'll let you read the notes later. Once, once I got to the MI5 site, you, you know, like, wasn't James Bond in MI5? Okay, okay. sorry, I'm wasting time here. So, um, so um, the Germans and the English are at war with one another, and um, in 1940, the Blitzkrieg, there's bombings um, over, over the United Kingdom. Um, in 1944, um, the Germans launched a, a new bomb. It was called the V-1 flying bomb. I can't pronounce the German name of it, but the, ger the German name means um, revenge, retaliation bomb, okay? However that is in German, it's, it's, it starts with a V. Um, but they also had names like Hellhound and Fire Dragon. Um, and this bomb, it, it was a cruise, it, basically a cruise missile. Um, it would be launched from, uh, from bases in France and uh, it was aimed toward the center of London. Um, the, the bomb would, would be projected and it made this horrible buzzing sound and the, the English would hear the sound and then the sound would stop, which meant that the, that the missile had run out of fuel and now was heading to the ground. Okay, so it was, it, it was, it was destructive because it, it was a two ton bomb, but it was also terrifying. So um, that was kind of its purpose, to terrify the citizens. And they, and the Germans were, were aiming these bombs at, at center, central London, the most populated area and the, the seat of government. Um, the English, um, one of the characters in the story is described as having a, a stiff upper lip, of course. Um, the English, in order to, uh, to, to lighten the, the fear that caused by this bomb, they call them doodle bugs, okay? The Germans were calling them hellhounds, and the English were like doodle bugs. And there's, I, I didn't write her name down, but there's this famous um, poet during one of these air raids, she's reading her poetry, and the sound is 
coming over overhead, and she's like, and she keeps reading just in a little louder voice, just strong English woman. <clears throat> anyway, um, th these bombs were very destructive. Um, again, aimed at London's populated center and government. Um, the, the English government came up with a, uh, a plan. Um, there, were, there were a couple of double agents who were, who were based in London. I gotta tell you, if you're curious about this kind of stuff, go to the MI5 site and read about these two guys. They, they are brilliant. Um, Juan Puyol um, was a Spanish um, double agent who created 27 fake identities and he kept sending information back to Germany from these 27 various personalities so much so that the Germans said, we don't need to send any more agents into London. There are 27 of them already. <laughs> he was brilliant. Um, um, Eddie Chapman, codenamed Zigzag, um, staged a fake bombing of a factory. And in one night, they covered this factory with, um, with uh, fake uh, evidence of an explosion. And it was so convincing that some of the factory workers thought, oh, our factory has been blown up. Um, the German reconnaissance planes looked down and they were like, okay, the, the deed is done. Um, Zigzag did what he said. Um, Eddie Chapman went back to Germany and for his work in London, he received the Iron Cross the highest honor that the Germans bestowed. And MI5 says, the only English citizen ever to receive the, the Iron Cross. Okay, so these two, these two guys, and there were others, were so convincing that the Germans said, we need to know where our bombs are landing. So guess what they did? They said, your bombs are landing too far north. <laughs> and so, the Germans readjusted their aim further south, away from the center of population. But, again, now here comes the ethical piece, for closer to a more impoverished community um, in South London. Now, there was a little bit of debate about that. Um, <clears throat> Herbert Morrison, Minister for Home Security, um, represented some of the some of the poor and he wasn't so ready to say yeah this is the right thing to do we should we should redirect the bomb from this group of people and we should direct it toward this group of people churchill said nah we're doing it and so churchill prevailed okay there i told that story really fast <laughs> you can have my four pages if you want to see more details um, what about the ethics of this? I just have to turn to my last page for that. Do you, first, first of all, what would you do? Would you, would you bomb the poorer neighborhoods? It's, by the way, one, one bomb broke some windows in Buckingham Palace and in the course of the early bombing, there was a chapel um, in, a, in a military compound. A, the bomb hit it directly and 120 people died, 140 were wounded. So the government was legitimately concerned about government buildings being disrupted. Um, in, in the end, one scientific advisor said, um, and this is a scientific advisor whose father, he said, lived in South London and his old school was in South London and he said, um, I know that I can't do the accent. I, I, would, I would, if I was in a high school classroom, I would, I would try the accent, but I'm not gonna do it with you. I know, I know neither my parents nor the school would have had it otherwise. It's like, they, are, are, they, they certainly would have volunteered to be bombed. <laughs> uh, 
he says that he, he believed that 10,000 lives were saved. Now, 6,000 in this, the, the bombing lasted from June to September, and then the British took out the, the, the bombing sites and so on. But in those months, um, 6,000 people were killed. And in, in, in just one of those South London neighborhoods, 57,000 homes were damaged. Okay, so we're weighing things here. What would you do? Talk among yourselves. <laughs> See if you can come make, make believe that you're each parliamentarians. <laughs> Go ahead. So what, what's the conclusion? Okay, you had your hand up earlier, so conclusion? What would you do? I, I, would, I agree with Churchill, um, because central London is the business community. That's where they probably manufacture goods, supplies, food, stuff like that. And to have that destroyed would hurt the entire country. So, what he brought up was a good thing. Have them bomb the southern London, but have the people evacuate first. Mm -hmm. Or try to uh, execute the evacuation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's one problem with that, though. If you tell the people to move, then the Germans will know that you know. How would they know that? Because of their spies. Well, there, there they are. Well, they had more than that. Okay. <laughs> but they were bombing all over London. Other, I other. We figured out someone, someone to, uh, We were thinking it would, it would hurt the credibility of those spies. Yeah. Their operation. Yeah, mm -hmm. potentially to have. Because I can imagine if you tell one person. Hey, there's gonna be a bomb here tonight. Get out. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> 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 maybe yeah. that's another ethical rule. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Who do you say? Yeah. yeah. Our table just went straight to the would you kill baby Hitler? I <laughs> 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 feel like this is a weak ethical question. <laughs> 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 So now you're doing time travel, <laughs> Star Trek mode, you know, going back. I mean, these are you're asking ethical questions. Okay. Yeah. Well, if, Would you? 
Would you kill baby Hitler? Uh, I used to think no, and now I think maybe yes. <laughs> if you want the real answer to that. <laughs> Okay. I, yeah, that's a hard I'm, one. I'm curious about when the change happened. Yeah. <laughs> During this class? <laughs> Your work is done. Yeah. You're teaching a hidden hack, Yes. If Well, if the, if the result has got to be to, to defeat the Germans for the good of the whole country, then somehow you've got to try to protect your, your central government structures. And so you have this terrible choice, you know, which, which of these two decisions is going to get us further to that, that goal of defeating them overall. So goal, yes. Jews will have the right decision. Hey, would you do me a favor? Let's, let's, let's stay with this story for just a moment, but let's add this layer. Um, do you see in this story um, compelling authority or law that we would say, oh yes, that's the reason? Would you, do you see any heart motivations that would say, oh yeah, that's the reason I would do this? And um, do you see any compelling goals or results that, again, talk among yourselves to see if you can find them. The, I feel like the, I, I won't say that. Go ahead, go ahead and talk, and then we'll talk again. And our motives are to save everybody. But I think my argument about the world is now more important than how many people live in the world. So it's almost like you have to decide every single time. I'm not really sure what the which of those is the priority. And it varies with the situation. They all fit, but you have to go against two of those to get one of them. When there's a dilemma. If there's no dilemma, then we don't work together. The law or principle. But then we would have to stop. Yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? The only thing I've got is I'm trying to think about the other two and how they would play out. And part of the decision, too, is that, like, for motives and attitudes, it is shifting risk from one group of people to another. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
<laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> well, I think there's, there, there's a couple of things here that we can go to uh, biblical law. But what's the value of human life? Is it a less dense populated area? So are you saving lives by moving it south? Okay. By the way... The other, the other thing is, and this one's very controversial, is just war. Is, is war ever justified? Okay. Okay. And then the other biblical principle of, like, protect your lowliest and your least, right? So now you oh. get to the whole, like, classic... To then justify the means thing. So, with your laws and principles, which which of those principles should prevail in this challenging situation? Right, and so you're you're observing that there's both, possibly. There's scripture that would say, "Protect the least of these." Did they? Yeah, I guess it depends how you do the yeah, math. Dan, Dan a, a potential argument on the other side would be, well, if we lose to the Germans, then we haven't protected any of our citizens at all. Yeah. And it was, at that point in the war, it was still pretty close as to who was going to be the victor. Uh, I think I've got to agree with him. If we're like a parliamentary member and... And Churchill is saying, this is what I want us to do. And I mean, he's the highest, I don't know where he ranks with regard to the king, but like he's the authority. Yeah. Um, and so I think we you know, honor that authority so we could justify, yeah, we have to do it because Churchill says so. Yeah, prime minister is appointed by the king. I mean, the parties may debate and, and propose, but it's the, it's the monarch who says, you are my prime minister. Mm -hmm. Yep, so there's, there's a, 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 a human authority right there. Yes? I mean, I'll, I'll go, just to play devil's advocate here, I'll go back on the other side, which is to yep. say, uh, we look at the civil rights movement of the 60s, right? And we say, mm -hmm. uh, how much better that um, people did not respond with violence, even though that there was, on the other side of it, a federal government that had a gun pointed at you. <laughs> Right? So you are at the point of a gun. It's not, I mean, it's, it's different, but it's not that different in some ways, right? right. Uh, same thing with the um, uh, Indian independence, right? And uh, Gandhi's movement of nonviolent resistance. And we as Christians hold that up and say, that's a, that's a beautiful thing because they, they held the integrity of their moral value and they took the, they, they took the, the bodily carnage of that for the, for the essentially the the, um, the moral win. Mm. And how much has that served our country? Mm. So, anyway, just saying, it is to point on how deep this, this can be in terms of what you do. Yeah. Um, there's a, I don't know how familiar you all are with the Anabaptist movement. I, and I should have looked this up because I thought about it last night. There's a group in the state of Washington. Eastern Washington, there, there are uh, settlements, settlements, there are communities of Hutterites, German immigrants who said, we will not fight. No, we will not even defend ourselves. And there were, there were people in, in England at this time who said, we should not fight. And they were, they were not um, favored. Whitaker Chambers. Okay. Um, so laws, motives. What motives do you see? Um, at our table, um, kind of two competing, well, not competing sets of motives, but two different <coughs> sets of motives. So one would be kind of a, how do you view hierarchy or social stratification? Um, so, you know, do these particular historical government buildings need to be protected? Do government officials need to be protected? Or are government officials there to serve? Can these thousand-year-old buildings be blown to smithereens and we just relocate to other parts of the city? Um, so kind of views how you view the purpose of government slash, you know, are these poor people in a lower station and less worthy to be protected? Um, another uh, that someone brought up was attitude towards South London. I mean, you could have a personal attachment to the area. Um, you could have family and friends in South London. Um, but it also, I mean, 
we have no idea how it was perceived, but it could have also been perceived as kind of like a hotbed of crime kind of area. You may even have a personal association with South London where someone you know has been brutally murdered or attacked in that area. Um, and so it might not seem so bad to bomb a whole bunch of the criminals and take care of a problem. <laughs> okay. What was the motive of the gentleman who said, I know neither my parents nor the school would have had it done otherwise. What's his, where is, where is his heart? Victory. Victory. And there's some pride, there's pride there and um, patriotism. Patriotism, yep, <clears throat> deep patriotism. Yep. Mm -hmm. Self-sacrifice. Self Self-sacrifice, yes. And then as someone said, the the results corner in this case is really the easiest, right? I mean, the, the guy who said, we saved 10,000 lives, um, you could say, oh, there, there you go, 10,000 lives. Oh, and, the, and we allowed the government to continue operating. There you go. It worked. Um, so, by the way, I really appreciated in, in a number of your conversations, you, you looked for um, support on both sides. Um, when I say that, don't, don't label me as a relativist. <clears throat> um, <laughs> what, what, what am I? Uh, um, but here's... never take a position. But, here's, but here's, here's the value in that. If you're having a conversation with someone, um, I feel like we've got a, some tools now where we can say, oh man, what is, what is this person's reason? Where, where are they coming from? Oh, they are appealing to this authority. You, you might say, I totally disagree with that, but now you understand. Oh, this, this person has a heart, and this is where, this is where, where their heart is. Is, this is what the motivation of their heart is. And again, you may or may not agree with them, but you could say, I, I understand what's going on here. And then with the results, um, you can have conversations and say, really, what is it, what's the outcome that you're looking for? Oh, I see. I understand the outcome. Um, this, this could be a really good juncture where we think about this whole kind of ethical framework in terms of our roles in life. Um, if, if you are a parent, if you are a neighbor, if you are a business person, if you are a teacher, um, you can use this as a tool. Um, think about relating to your kids and saying, What's going? What is? What is the? What is the dynamic here? Oh, <laughs> the the dynamic is just to get the result, and then you can you can guide and counsel and redirect and say, I th I think this is what this is the result you're looking for, but maybe there's a different result that you should look for, or maybe you can say, hmm, where is where is this person's heart? Ah. I think maybe I can redirect this person in terms of um, maybe praying for a changed heart and counseling them to change their heart. And then thinking about laws, we can say, um, you realize that you're violating this particular authority and you could, you could try to steer a person. So I, I feel like there's a in terms of having conversations with people, it gives us a tool for understanding where the person's coming from. And in terms of our roles in life, um, we can be more specific and say, rather, rather than simply saying, oh, you are just wrong. <laughs> we find that a little bit and say, hmm, laws, motives, results. Um, by the way, just for convenience, from this point on, I, I use these as, um, as labels in that order um, because it, it, it becomes a, a functional framework and a functional tool. So laws, motives, results. On the next couple of slides, um, I'm gonna 
I'm going to share more about um, these three corners. In the future, I'm going to spend more time defining what I believe is a Christian ethical system. I feel like everyone uses this. Again, I'm, you can challenge me on that. I, I may be wrong. Um, I feel like everyone uses this, but how, how would a Christian, what, what's the authority for a Christian? What's the motive for a Christian? What's the, re, the end result for a Christian? Um, for today, it's gonna seem a little bit more generic. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna help to define these three corners a little bit more. So here's the first one. <clears throat> um, what, what are the kinds of questions that we can ask to help identify this first corner of authority? What does the law say? Um, what are the standards or the rules? Um, what principles should be followed? Is it legal? <laughs> um, and then there's all, I'm using the word law to be inclusive of this category, but there are a lot of synonyms. And I, here's, here are some of them. You can talk about the norms of a community you can talk about the rules of a game. You can talk about the principles that are at work, the regulations. Who is the authority in this case? Um, who commands? What are the statutes? Um, is there a code of conduct? So um, all of these, these questions are ways to help us identify law and authority. Um, oh, there's one more. Who says? <laughs> That's a great one. Who says? Who, who says he's the best um, baseball player? Who said? Who's the authority? <laughs> what makes that answer right? Um, comments or thoughts about this? Well, it seems that it uh, you know, doesn't come out here. Maybe you're planning on it later. But biblical law seem, should be at the very top. Right. And, and that will come out later. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we'll spend some time later on in this class kind of digging even further into that. Um, you know, because there are laws in the Bible that perplex us. So, yeah, but everybody has, I shouldn't say that. I think people operate on the basis of some authority, um, except if you're Nietzsche. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and, he, and he, he really said, he really tried to say, there's no such thing. God is dead. Okay, um, let's keep going. So law, Motives. Um, here are the kinds of questions that we ask to help um, discern if, if it's a motive at work. What's a person's attitude? What's the condition of your heart? What motivates you? Is it loving? Um, I singled out that particular motive because it it becomes a big one in some ethical systems that say, just do the loving thing. Just do the loving thing and you'll be fine. Um, what do you feel like doing? What do you value? <clears throat> um, and then some synonyms, motives, feelings, emotions, value, values, attitudes, desires, wants, hopes, heart, soul, um, can you think of other questions that might be asked that will help discern what's going on inside? Can motives cause us to do the wrong thing? Absolutely. All the time. Every day for me. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yes. I mean, you mentioned this in feelings, but like, what scares you? What are you afraid of? Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's like, I don't know, I think a lot of, I think I make decisions out of fear. Yeah. Sometimes, you know. So, mm -hmm. 
I think yeah. we're already basic connection for most of that. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's going to get a little tricky when we start to talk about motives and results because they are so closely related. And I, so I use the word motive because I'm thinking about, um, about someone standing behind me, pushing me. Okay, that's, a, that's my image of a motive. A result is me saying, I'm gonna, I want that. And so me, me going and saying, I'm, I want this result. Now, I don't know that it's so easy to distinguish these two. But as, as much as we can distinguish them, that's what, that's what my intention is. So motive is more internal, and it's more of the push, the motive force. Has that en engineers in here? Motive, motive force, okay. Um, so it's, it's the heart that pushes us. Um, then finally, results. What are the results? Consequences. Are there, what are the risks? <clears throat> what are the benefits? And then there's just, a, there's a ton of words. Um, outcome, goal, end. Um, later on, we will talk about um, teleos, which is the Greek word for end, where we, we decide on an ethical choice based on the end result. And um, I, feel, I feel like, this is just my intuition on this, I feel like we spend a, a lot of time talking about end results. I almost feel like that's the most popular um, method of making decisions. Um, we, we really look for what's going to happen, what I want to happen. Um, I, I also sense that it's, it might be the least biblical approach, which we'll, we'll deal with more later on. Results, outcomes, goals, consequences, costs. I can't kill baby Hitler is what you're saying. What's that? I can't kill baby Hitler is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, here's... I, here's, a, here's an insight into what I just said. Yeah, no, I, think I think because we, we aim for a result, but it's the least, it's not predictable as we think it is. Yeah, I think, I think that's the problem mm -hmm. with using results. I think we, we would love to be omniscient. If I do this, this is what's going to happen. And we have, we have no way of knowing that. Yeah. So, Dale, would you yes. to your previous question about Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> See, I, I knew you guys were going to get complex on me here. No, you, I, what do you all think? See, look, in the previous slide, um, I, have the, I have two words, two, two problematic words, desires and wants. And desires and wants always look for some kind of result. But I've got them in the motive side. So if I want a clear conscience, what is that? Is that a motive or is that a result? I'm, I think I'm going to have to suggest that I can't always sort those out. Um, I think a person can say, ah, I, I'm, I am, my goal is a clear conscience. And I, I would call that a result. Um, when I do that, then I say to myself, so what's the motive? What's, what's going on? Um, well, I was just thinking, too, because of the, the clean engine room example that C.S. Lewis had, like that's what yeah. I think of. I think of a clean conscious as being a clean engine room kind of thing. So for me, that was sort of the yeah. immediate thought that I had. So that's more of a, of, yeah. Um, and is a clear conscience um, 
a reputation, or is it just is it just for me? Because um, I because I always look at motives as being more internal, and I look at results as being more external. Wouldn't clear conscience go back to number one? Did I did I comply with <coughs> principles and law? It could be connected, but it's the principles and law are not the clear conscience. It's it's obeying them that might give but you the results. If I violate those laws, I would not have a clear conscience. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Do you have thoughts on your question? I mean, I probably put it in two as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. I guess it comes. The question comes from like if I'm having conversations with clients, I tend to steer them more in that direction. Like, um, you know, who are not believers, and I can't just say follow God's law. I suppose I could. They might not come back. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I'm trying to help them to, to think about like what are your values, and mm -hmm. um, is your conduct in line with your values? And one way to tell that is like, do you feel legitimate, like warranted guilt, um, or not? I mean, we can feel we might think of as more unjustified guilt that's maybe more coming from other people, but is it really a reflection of your own convictions? Um, I don't know. So for me, that feels like an important one. How I'm trying to get people to be aware of and act in alignment with their values. Um, you know, and again, for believers, it's a lot more clear-cut what yeah. those values ought to be. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like putting that, from, what, from our conversation just now, I like putting that in the, in the heart section. Any other thoughts? Because we're, we're about to close this, this lesson. A couple of things that we're going to look forward to is we're going to look at um, how we can look at this framework from a Christian perspective. Um, remember, I used some of this with teacher preparation for teachers who are not necessarily teaching in a Christian context. They are themselves Christians, but they have to be able to use stuff like this in a classroom where not everybody has the same foundation. Um, so, we're, but we'll, we'll look at it from a, a distinctively Christian perspective. We'll also look at um, what happens if we only focus on law, if we only focus on motives, and if we only focus on results. There's, there's some consequences <laughs> with that. Um, and so, and then we'll look at more biblical um, examples. The, the Micah 6, 8, I think, is a, is a good example. But I think this theme this occurs over and over again in Scripture. Any last comments? Are these uh, slides on the website or anywhere that we can refer to them? Yes. Um, each week, I give my slide um, for that week to the tech people here. And I think they post them on the School of Discipleship site. And I think there's also um, a video. Oh, okay. It's all yeah. on YouTube, the Trinity <coughs> YouTube channel. Huh? John can direct you, John Gross. Yep. Oh, okay. I didn't know they had a YouTube yeah. channel. Yeah, but I've, I've also looked at the School of Discipleship on the, on the church's okay. website, and the documents um, for the classes are there as well. That's it for today. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Dan.